The amount of what goes on in our psyche, in our thoughts and feelings, that shows up on the surface of our lives is often very small. I know it's a cliche, but that tip of the iceberg thing is a really great metaphor. Somebody can seem like they're happy and collected on the surface, but are living in a hidden world of sadness or fear or confusion. Celebrities who seem to have everything in life can actually be profoundly tormented inside. Or in a positive sense, someone who seems unresponsive can actually have a rich inner life. Someone in meager surroundings may have more joy than any of us. It's hard to tell just by looking at the outside. It could be that there's no one who's had the outer elements of their life looked over and scrutinized more than Jesus Christ. Whole cultures have been based around what he said and did. But you gotta wonder, what's the rest of the iceberg? was going on inside him. Believe it or not, tonight we're going to poke our heads under the water. All right, everybody, welcome back to another episode of Swedenborg Light and Life. I mean, not Swedenborg Life, but Swedenborg and Life. My name is Curtis. And I've already messed up my hosting. That's fine. And we'll answer them. You can have your, your input if you want me to clarify something. If you just want to write, do it, and we'll try to get it in there. So yeah, today we're going to discuss Jesus Christ and actually the inner world of Jesus Christ. What was going on inside the person? That seems like, if you know, if it seems like whether even whether you could even know if Jesus existed is hard enough. How could you ever know what was going on in the mind? Welcome to the show. This is where we look at things like that, and it's all through Swedenborg, and you'll see how it all works. Now, so let's get into it. It's a lo- it's a big topic, so we want to make sure we're thorough, but get you out of here sometime before next week. Part one, now. So we begin the journey in the wilderness. And this is a place where these struggles happen for Jesus, but they also happen for us. And it's not, even though there is a literal wilderness in the text that Jesus is known from, this place is a metaphor or a correspondence that symbolizes a state that we all go through. And we're going to get into the meaning of that as we move. But first, that's where we are. All right, so the inner life of Jesus Christ. Swedenborg has this fascinating take on the whole thing, and to introduce it, we have Dr. Jonathan Rose, the series editor of the New Century Edition translation of Swedenborg's works. He's going to introduce our topic to us. So here he goes. What Swedenborg says is that Jesus had a rich inner life that was going on within him all during this time. Uh, and that you don't see it on the surface of Scripture, or there's not much. There are little hints here and there, but you don't see it much on the surface of Scripture, what he was going through. Purpose was the salvation of the whole human race, and you can see that clearly taught in Scripture. And so what he was doing in this world was going after people's salvation and trying to set the stage for salvation. What a lot of people don't realize is that a lot of what he had to do in this world was actually internal. Just like, isn't that how it is in our lives? I mean, we do some things on the external side of things, but isn't a lot of the work that we do in our life, a lot of this, if someone was to write the story of your life, wouldn't a lot of it be psychological, how things made you feel? An event that that seems rather innocuous to outside people could have a huge impact in your life. You keep going back and thinking about it. Isn't that where it happens? And Swedenborg is saying, that was happening for Jesus Christ too. And so, let's take a look at what exactly that mental landscape was like for him. This is from Secrets of Heaven, 1690. This is a number we're going to come back to a lot. There's this bracket six. Some of the larger numbers are divided up. You're going to see all the different brackets here. Okay, again, yeah, Swedenborg says that he learned through his spiritual experiences what was going on. So here it is for your scrutiny. The Lord, and when Swedenborg says the Lord, that means Jesus Christ. It means God but a God we can relate to as in human form. The Lord was attacked by all the hells from his early in his youth up to the very end of his life in the world, while he was continually routing, subduing, and vanquishing them. This he did purely out of love for the entire human race. Since his love was not human but divine, and the greater the love, the harder the struggle. You can see how fierce aiming here that I had exper- living experience of this, however that came about, enough that this is not don't doubt it. This is true. Okay, so he doesn't always put that exclamation point on it, but he did here, and I think that speaks to the gravity of the subject. All right, so um, where does it say that? 
Where does it say that, that Jesus Christ had all these uh, internal struggles? Secrets of Heaven 1690, bracket 2. I told you we'd get to these different brackets. The word's description of the Lord's life in the Gospels mentions none of his trials outside his final crisis, meaning the, the crucifixion, except for the one he faced in the wilderness. No others were revealed to the disciples. Those that were revealed seem so mild that they hardly amount to anything, as far as the literal story goes. To speak and answer in that way is no trial. And this is referring to the story of Jesus in the wilderness, which we'll be getting to soon. The fact is, though, that he was tested more severely than any human mind could ever grasp or believe. No one can know what a spiritual crisis is like except the person who has lived through one. And I would say, you know... There's a similar phenomena if you've never struggled with mental illness of any kind. If you don't know what it's like to have depression or obsessive compulsive disorder or bipolar or something, it's hard to understand what that kind of uh, mental, internal, out of control or pain and anguish is like. It seems like just get a hold of it, just get your thoughts together. You know. So Swedenborg here is saying unless you've had spiritual crises these deep kind of internal struggles, it's hard to imagine why it would be such a big deal what Jesus Christ was going through. So let's look at these spiritual struggles a little bit. These are things that are not just, that that we all go through. The things that Jesus did is basically us just amped way up, you know? And there's no way to actually grow spiritually, as Swedenborg says, without going through these struggles. These are essential steps in sort of the stairs of our Growth. And then, okay, here's a, a couple of bullet points about them. We're just going to summarize it. You could do a whole show, which we actually did, and I'll talk about that in a moment. They're, basically, they are internal conflicts. This is the clashing of good and evil, or of truth and, truth and falsity, of the opposites inside our minds, inside our, of our psyches. Next one, they are attended, you, you feel them, you experience them as anxiety, on the one hand, if it's an intellectual conflict or inner pain, if it's an emotional slash spiritual, um, you know, a will, a temptation of the will or the emotive side of things. And then also, sometimes they are tied to outer things, like there's an event, you, you get sick or something like that, and that begins this sort of crisis for you, or, or something happens, some traumatic event, or there, there's some, yeah, something that's bothering you, and that's what, that's what kicks it off, or sometimes it's purely like an internal world. And it's, as I said before, it's part of our growth process. This is just like um, what they call growing pains on a spiritual level. So that's just, that's just a little bit on them. We'll, you'll see more about how it actually works as we go through. And also, we did an entire show on it. Uh, it's called The Purpose of Spiritual Struggles. So you can get on our channel or search that or something like that. It's not as easy to find them. But that, we go in detail about these struggles from our perspective. Now we're going to look at them What's it like when God goes through those things? Okay, so to get further into that, uh, let's go back to Jonathan Rose as he introduces this sort of what was the task uh, before Jesus? God, as he is in himself, just cannot be tested, cannot be tempted, is absolutely impervious to anything. Just d- deals with it instantly. You could no more, uh, hell could no more attack what is divine then um, you could try to drive a bulldozer into the sun and carve a piece out of it. Or, you know, you'd be cooked so uh, millions of miles before you even got close to the sun. Uh, that's what God is like in and of himself. So if that's not enough for you, this from True Christianity 124 says, uh, if Jehovah God, as he is in himself, were only to breathe on those who are in hell, he would instantly kill them all. Killing everyone is not funny. There's just something about that phrase that I found a little bit funny. So, here you have God, and God is infinitely powerful and infinitely good. How can God go through the kind of crises that we go through? Aren't all of our crises based on weaknesses that we have, or based on doubt, or gaps in our understanding, or some kind of mental chemical flaw in a way? So, how could God go through something like that? Well, there was this uh, technology or this partnership uh, that we call Mary. Uh, Mary is an important figure in a lot of traditions, particularly Catholicism. Uh, and Swedenborg has, an, as I always say, an interesting take on the role that she plays. And it's not the same role 
that she's sometimes cast in. I'll let him explain Secrets of Heaven 1444. No one can undergo spiritual crisis unless something bad clings to the person. No one devoid of evil can suffer the least tribulation. Evil is what the hellish spirits stir up. These hellish spirits uh, being the ones that Swedenborg says bring on these crises. The Lord had no actual evil, no evil of his own, as all the rest of us do. What he had was evil inherited from his mother. Okay, so, don't panic. You might, what do you mean Mary was evil? He says, it's not that simple. Let's talk, let's take a little tangent on hereditary evil. This is a phenomenon that Swedenborg described that is basically, there is a tendency towards negative things present in every human being. That's what he says. You can see this for yourself if you want to go to a playground somewhere. Uh, You will see, these are little kids, they've barely been influenced by the world at all, and you'll see them vacillate between very, very good impulses, you know, they want to share, they want to play with each other, to, uh, you took my toy, I'm going to hit you, I'm screaming because you went up the slide before me, I'm throwing myself on the ground because I didn't get the snack I want, right? So we have the, we have tendencies in both directions, and the tendency towards the negatives, the ego, self-centered side of things is this hereditary evil that Swedenborg is talking about. This is the the flawed foibles that get passed down. He says it gets passed down like genetics are passed down physically. This psychological condition of hereditary evil is passed on generation to generation. So what Mary was, was she was a perfectly nice person. Sweden even t- Swedenborg even talked about meeting her once, but we won't get into that. She was nice, but she, like all of us, had this hereditary evil. So when God was born from her, he picked that up, and that was a key tool in making this whole thing work. So there you go. There's that. So now, God's got his hereditary evil, so that makes it so hell can approach him. So now he's ready to fight, beat them all up, right? Except that is not that doesn't quite jive with what you would picture love, like divine love doing. Does divine love get psyched up to, to fight? Let's take a look. True Christianity 56, Swedenborg kind of drives this home. It's not in the nature. He's, we're jumping into the middle of a passage where he just made some points, and he says, From these few points, you see how insane people are who think that God can condemn anyone, curse anyone, throw anyone into hell, predestine anyone's soul to eternal death, avenge wrongs, or rage against or punish anyone. People are even more insane if they actually believe this, let alone teach it, zing. He's getting at the preachers of his time. In reality, God cannot turn away from us or even look at us with a frown. To do any such thing would be against his essence. And what is against his essence is against himself. So what's going to happen here? So God God needs to do all this fighting, but he doesn't get mad at people. So how does the dynamic work? What is God trying to do? I don't know. But Jonathan Rose does, and he's going to illuminate it for us. So he needed to have some way to try to deal with evil. And the trick of this thing was to be able to deal with evil in such a way that you deal with it, you know, and that you draw a line. You say, you cannot pass beyond this point because hell was threatening the whole human race at that point. Uh, So you have to draw this line in the sand and say, come no farther than this. And yet the divine love is a love for everybody. It's not like he loves the good people and he hates the evil people. You can read scriptures that that say that in the appearance of the text, but that's not the way that divine love works. Divine love is absolute. It's just a blanket. It's like the sun shining in the sky. When scripture says that he sends his rain on the just and on the unjust and that kind of thing, his 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 mercy is just. It, doesn't Shakespeare say his mercy is not strained? You know, it falls on everybody. That divine mercy, it, it can't be looking one, you know, making a face at this person but smiling about this other person. It doesn't work that way any more than the sun smiles at one person and frowns at another person. So he had to have some way to come down, to bring some of that divine essence down into this human form to be able to deal with the darkness that was coming from hell. And part of what he needed to do was to deal with it, draw a line in the sand and say, you're not going any farther than this, but do it in such a way without destroying 
you know, there's much more destruction in angry birds than there is in what Jesus did to the evil spirits. You know, in angry birds, the, the, the pigs blow up all the time. You pop them, you know. He was coming here to deal with the pigs, get them back where they're supposed to be, but not pop them because he loves them. So I was watching Swedenborgian Life today. Oh, what'd you learn? God loves the piggies. If you take away one thing, God loves the piggies. So what God had to do is God wants to save the whole human race, wants to get evil as contained as possible, make everybody be able to live as happy a life in as much community as they can as possible. So first of all, to set things in order, God needed to go through these struggles. So what does he do? He gets this way to sort of plug into the human condition. We know his mission is to not kill all the evil people, the evil spirits, all that, because he likes them. He wants to try to make them happy too. So we've got all the stage set, and this mission was accomplished through these spiritual struggles. And Swedenborg says that there's actually one story in the New Testament, which is uh, Jesus's temptation in the wilderness. Have you guys heard of that? We'll read it for you. You'll get it. Um, and it is this. It is in summary everything. That Jesus went through. That it's not that he went through it all during that, but that it is an overall compendium of all the spiritual struggles of Jesus Christ. So you want to look at that? Let's do it. Part two, coming up now. Man, that makes me hungry. Um, okay. Let's, before we get into what, so the stones to bread is from the Bible story, but before we get exactly into what that means, let's set up a few more things on these combats in general, and specifically those that Jesus went through. True Christianity 2 through 3, the Lord, again that meaning Jesus Christ, came into the world to separate hell from the human race, and that he accomplished this, this is, we're jumping in the middle, that's why the grammar's like it is, and that he accomplished this by repeatedly doing battle with hell and conquering it. In this way, he gained control over it, forced it back into the divine design, and made it obey him. Jehovah God came down and took on a human manifestation for the purpose of forcing everything in heaven, everything in hell, and everything in the church back into the divine design. The power of hell had become stronger than the power of heaven, and on earth the power of evil had become stronger than the power of goodness. Therefore, total damnation stood threatening at the door." which you don't want that threatening at the door, man. By means of, this human, of his human manifestation, which was divine truth, Jehovah God lifted this pending damnation and redeemed both people and angels. Afterward, in his human manifestation, he united divine truth to divine goodness, or divine wisdom to divine love. In this way, he returned to the divine nature that he had he had from eternity, together with and in the human manifestation which had been glorified. From all this, it is clear that if the Lord had not come into the world, no one could have been saved. So those are the stakes. Nobody could have been saved if this hadn't happened. And Jesus, uh, I mean, Swedenborg is not alone in saying that about Jesus, right? That's, that's pretty common. But there's a different way that he goes about it, uh, according to Swedenborg. So, uh, final thing about these temptations, what are these struggles or whatever you want to call them? In, in the older Swedenborg translations, they're translated temptations. They're also called spiritual struggles. Did I already say this? Spiritual struggles, shatterings, those kinds of things. So those, if you're searching Swedenborg, that's what you're looking for. But what were those things like? I mean, the story coming up, it's just it just sort of is a ask and answer with questions. Is that what the, the battles were for Jesus? Jonathan Rose continues uh, with his tirade about the whole thing. It is important to know, however, that the Lord's battle with the hells was not some verbal to and fro like a philosophical debate or a legal battle. That kind of battle has no effect whatever on hell. It was a spiritual battle using the divine truth connected with divine good, the very vitality of the Lord. When this truth visibly flows in, no one in the hells is able to oppose it. There is so much power in it that when demons from hell merely sense that it might be present, they run away, throw themselves down into deep places and squeeze into underground shelters to hide. 
This phenomenon is the same thing des described in Isaiah. They will go into caverns in the rocks and into crevices in the dust, dreading Jehovah when he rises to terrify the earth. Isaiah 2 verse 19. And in the book of Revelation, they will all hide themselves in caves in the rocks and in the rocks on the mountains. And they will say to the mountains and the rocks, fall on us and hide us from the face of the one sitting on the throne and from the anger of the lamb. End quote. Several things to love in there. Um, his statement, that kind of battle has no effect whatever on hell. I just like, like hell just thrives on debate. <laughs> point counterpoint and well not everyone is happy and you know <laughs> like like sort of getting into it they love to just get into it like that that's not what it was the divine truth it's it's hard to put into words uh the divine truth is so terrifying and so powerful that that light that just inescapable search light you know that blasting light is like Hell doesn't want to have anything to do with it. And and so that power of divine truth, that's what he kept doing, just bringing the power of divine truth and they run away and then, you know, and, and he brings it to this and he brings it to that. And he was able to bring that because of being part human, part divine. You know, he was able to bring that. This statement at the end about, you know, hide us from the anger of the lamb. There, there are a few... Uh, animals that embody r rage and predatory destruction more effectively than a lamb. Uh, I think I'm joking. Uh, what you see in this is the picture of it. The Lord was a lamb. It's not that he was angry. He just came with his light and his love. And they went, ah, I got to get out of here. And they jump over the cliff and run away and, and try to hide, you know. So that increased presence. And he knew that would be tough on them. Uh, when he comes closer, but that phrase of the anger of the lamb gives you a little sense. Some people, I think, mistakenly think that Jesus is just full of rage and revenge and comes into the world and all that because of certain literal statements that are made. But, but they're um, that's that's not the right word. Rightly divided, you know. And I didn't make it totally clear in the beginning, but we opened on him reading a Swedenborg quote about this, so that's why he said end quote. It wasn't him reading his own notes. So, so that's what that's from. But. The point is that, you know, first of all, yeah, the anger of the Lamb, this is, not, this is not that kind of raging God, but still, love and truth can be scary if you love evil and falsity as the counterpoint. Um, but also that the, the battles, it's not just, you'll see, upcoming in the story, you'll hear on the literal sense, uh, what about this? Well, I'll say this to that. It just sounds like you're having just a pretty tame debate, but it's not that. It's this internal clash. It's something that part of it we, which we can understand and part of it is just beyond our ability to grasp. All right, so we'll get into that. Swedenborg says that the, the, the struggle in temptations can be felt as a distress of mind or even an inner burning pain. So it, it goes beyond just ideas, right? All right, so here's the story itself. We'll begin this, the temptations in the wilderness. Then Jesus was led up by the Spirit into the wilderness to be tempted by the devil. And when he had fasted forty days and forty nights, afterward he was hungry. Now when the tempter came to him, he said, If you are the Son of God, command that these stones become bread. But he answered and said, It is written, Man shall not live by bread alone, but by every word that proceeds from the mouth of God. All right, so here we have the story of the stones into bread. So th that's exactly what we're talking about. So I, we open this show saying, oh man, Jesus went through the hardest temptations in the world, the hardest struggles ever. And you can see them summarizing this, this story of the wilderness. And it comes out saying like, Jesus got hungry. And hey, if you're hungry, make these into bread. No, I, I won't do that. What's so bad about that? I mean, I, it could be bad to be hungry, but... But what's so bad about that? So let's look a little more into what it means. Back in our favorite number, Secrets of Heaven, sixteen ninety. Uh, this is, uh, oh no, sorry. This is this is up before we do that. This is from Revelation Unveiled five forty six. You can see it on the screen yourself. A wilderness in the word symbolizes number one. There's multiple meanings. Swedenborg says all these these different things can correspond to multiple different things. So here he's listing them. Number one, a church devastated were one in which the word's truths have been falsified, as was the case at the time of the Lord's advent. So basically a defunct religious system. 
to a church without truths, because it does not have the word, as was the case with the upright Gentiles at the time of the Lord's advent. So this is either like you you don't have the truth or you have wrecked it by living counter to it. But that, those are sort of general and have to do with institution, but we're looking at number three, a state of temptation or trial in which a person is seemingly without truths, being surrounded by evil spirits who induce the temptation or trial and appear to rob him of his truths. And further about the wilderness, since a wilderness signifies a state of temptations, and forty, whether years or days, the whole duration thereof from beginning to end, therefore the temptations of the Lord, which were the most dreadful of all, and which he sustained from childhood to the passion of the cross, are meant by the temptation of forty days in the wilderness. So do you get that? Forty is a symbol for completion. So in the style of writing, something happens for 40 days or 40 years, it means from beginning to end. So this, in the wilderness, the wilderness is that state of mind of temptation, like we're saying, Jesus was in there for his whole life till it was completed. You know, that's what that's saying. And then, and that all temptations have to do with love. And if you think about, as the more you love something, the more pain you can have around it, right? So with Jesus Christ, this is the whole human race. He's thinking about and worried about and caring about. So you could start to think about how much how much combat there could be around something like that. You think about your family members. Are you ever worried about them? Is, are their lives turning out well? Are they on a good path? Is everything going to go well for them? Where are they now? They haven't called. Think of your family was everybody. And you want you loved everybody. You wanted everyone to turn out well. There's a lot of room to be attacked surrounding that. And that was the basis of this this, uh, these temptations that he went through. So looking specifically at the stones to bread, this, the, the devil asks him, why don't you turn these stones into bread? Uh, so why, what's the deal there? Why, why doesn't he just do it? That's a good idea. If you're hungry, why don't you just do that? Well, what, what's the moral component here? What's at stake? So let's take a look at what Swedenborg says this means. Secrets of Heaven, 1690, bracket 3. All trials target the love we feel. The severity of the trial matches the nobility of that love. If love is not the target, there is no trial. To destroy a person's love is to destroy the core of that person's life, since love is life. The Lord's life was love for the whole human race, a love so great and good that it was pure, unalloyed love. He allowed this life of his to be attacked continuously from the dawn of his youth until his final moments in the world. Love, which was the absolute core of the Lord's life, is symbolized by this. He was hungry, and the devil said, If you are the Son of God, say to this stone that it should become bread. And Jesus answered, It is written, Humankind is not to live by bread alone, but by every word of God. As we read, and then further from Apocalypse Explained 617. It is said here that the Lord hungered and thirsted because from his divine love he desires the salvation of all. Spiritual food is love, right? The spiritual water is the truth. Just like the body needs food and water, the spirit needs love and truth. And so Jesus was hungry because he desired the good of the whole human race, meaning he wanted to help the whole human race. So that's where the basis of this hunger and this temptation around it. As for what the the nuances of this thing are, why the stones to bread, why he couldn't, shouldn't do that, Swedenborg is actually surprisingly opaque there. Unless I missed it, um, there, there's not a real specific thing there. It could be something about eating uh, the stones being exterior, natural, uh, bread being interior, uh, more spiritual things, like the things that make up your life should be you know, the, the things that are spiritual rather than natural. But I, I think, what I think it is, and I feel like I've read this in Swedenborg, but maybe I couldn't, fi- I couldn't find it this time, maybe it's in there, is that it's about, so this is conjecture, this is not medical advice, but it's about forcing people to be good. Because the devil says, command the stones to become bread. And that has an element of forcing to it. So wouldn't there be, if you were worried about everyone's happiness and you knew people were harming themselves, wouldn't there be this temptation? Just, just force them to be good, right? But that would destroy us because the free will 
is not just a nice add-on to human beings, it's, it's the essential nature of human beings. You have to be free to be a conscious entity that feels like it's separate, and that's what we are. So there was some, something in that realm is what the pain uh, was about that, that Jesus was going through there, right? So from those, you can kind of form your own picture of, of what the whole thing was about. It had something to do with all that, all right? Cool. So that's that one, but there were two other temptations in the wilderness between Jesus and the devil. And if you're wondering about the devil, we just did an episode, Is the Devil Real? What is the devil? Spoiler, uh, the devil is is the name for evil and, and hell in its entirety. Right? So I won't get into that. You can watch that episode. All right, let's move on to the other two temptations in part three. So there are two other temptations, and these are symbolic of the two major battles or major evils that all of us struggle with in our own current lives. Uh, There's the categories uh, of that struggle. So Jesus was taking these on in these two stories. And I want to say a couple things about that before we get into the specific story. So first, Secrets of Heaven 1690. The trial mentioned in Matthew 4, Mark 1, and Luke 4, that's what we're reading right now, sums up all the Lord's trials, which consisted in his battling the self-love and materialism that filled the hells out of love for the entire human race. So there they are, self-love and materialism. And if you've been around the show, we do talk about those. They're also called love of self and love of the world. And we'll get a little into what those things mean. We also want to take a look at Secrets of Heaven 4287. And this is describing how the combat took place. Indeed, he allowed into himself all the hells in their order, and even the angels, as will be explained later on. Wait, what? The angels? <laughs> Sorry, that's the first time we've done anything that cool on this show. Even the angels. If you didn't, ca- if the, if you didn't catch that, there was a temptation involving this struggle with the hells, but also some kind of struggle with the angels in heaven. What's that all about? Well, we're not going to tell you. Well, okay, we'll tell you, but later in the show. This is a trick to get you to stay tuned to the end. At the end, we'll talk about this, all right? For now, just trust us, and let's move on. In so doing, he brought into order everything in the heavens and in the hells, and at length glorified himself. That is, made the human within him divine. All right, so that's what was going on, and let's see how it happened here. Let's continue with our story. Then the devil took him up into the holy city and set him on the pinnacle of the temple and said to him, If you are the son of God, throw yourself down, for it is written, He shall give his angels charge over you. And in their hands they shall bear you up, lest you dash your foot against a stone. Jesus said to him, It is written again, You shall not tempt the Lord your God. So we begin with Jesus taken up to the temple tower. So this is a struggle. It's all symbolic. The fact that there's a tower and a temple symbolizes something. The fact that the what the devil said to him up there symbolizes something. It's all that's that's how this is not just a you know one night that Jesus had a bad time. This is a symbolism of the entire struggle. And the more we learn about the way Jesus did it, the more we learn about how it shows up in our own lives. All right. So that's those are the stakes. That's what we're dealing with here. Let's go back to Secrets of Heaven 1690 bracket 5 this time. He fought against self-love and everything bearing its stamp. So this first one is this self-love. As symbolized by these words, the devil took him into the holy city and stood him on a pinnacle of the temple and said, if you are the son of God, throw yourself down. The same thing we just read. And then below that, he says, his constant victory is symbolized by the statement that after his trial, angels came close and tended to him. And we'll have more on that, the angels coming close and tending to him in just a second. But for now, it's, it's about self-love. So he takes him up onto the temple and says, throw yourself down. And this is somehow what this is about when you look in the inner meaning is this. And it's not self-love, as Swedenborg describes, as I always explain, is not, um, I love myself. Like, I'm great. Actually, you know what? I am cool. People do think I'm cool. You know, I have some quirks, but I'm great. You know, uh, that's not it. It is, I love myself and I don't love anyone else. I if, if there's one bag of food and one jug of water that would last, would feed seven people, I'm stealing it and running off so I can live for a week on it. 
you know, even though there's six other people here with me. That's, you're only thinking about yourself. That's love of self. And it even gets worse than that. But, but that, that, that the, the, the longing for power, the longing to control other people, to dominate them, the reason people go to war to expand their territory, the reason tr- people try to force them to do what they want, the pe- reason people um, take revenge if someone's insulted them or, or crossed them in some way, the reason people crave things, is that's self-love. That's the, this root of evil. That shows up in a million different ways in everybody, and this is when God was taking that thing head on. All right? So that's that one, but we've been on the tower. Now, what's the mountain? Um, yeah, yeah, what's the mountain? I almost thought I got it wrong, but let's take a look. Again, the devil took him up on an exceedingly high mountain and showed him all the kingdoms of the world and their glory. And he said to him, all these things I will give you if you will fall down and worship me. Then Jesus said to him, Away with you, Satan, for it is written, You shall worship the Lord your God, and him only you shall serve. Then the devil left him, and behold, angels came and ministered to him. So, we've gone from the temple up to the mountain. And that here, it's not just the mountain itself, but that he's taken up there, and the devil says, Here's all the kingdoms of the world in a moment, and I'll give you those if you worship me. So, what does it mean? Let's take a look first, Secrets of Heaven, 1690, again, bracket four, that he fought against love of the world, or against all that constitutes love of the world, is meant by the devil's taking him onto a high mountain and showing him all the kingdoms of the world in a moment of time. Don't get confused by the terminology. Love of the world sounds like you love the world, man. That's not so bad. What it means is uh, materialism is a pretty good word for it. It means gratification. Uh, you know, love of the world is what makes people, I'm going to set up a scheme where I'm going to defraud people of their whole retirement savings. I'm going to take that money and I'm going to run to another country and and use it to buy myself a yacht. And Because I want this pleasure of these, the finer things in life, I will, I will put anybody in jeopardy to get those. It's greed. Um, it is all kinds of uh, just ruining your lives and other people's lives to get gratification. That that shows up all over. You know, the, pe- the people's longing for specific goods. I mean, they got, they got elephants and rhinoceroses are like almost extinct, but people are like, I got to have that ivory. You know, I got to have that ivory, so I'm going to kill this elephant. You know, that that's the kind of love of the world. Like, forget everything else that's important. I want something shiny. That's love of the world, and it comes up. So this is God taking that on, head on, and, and the, the, the whole war inside against that. Mountains and towers. Why is he pulled up on these two different things? Let's take a look. This is Secrets of Heaven, 1691. The fact that a mountain is self-love and materialism. So, And also, I say, hey, this one is self-love, this is material. Swedenborg kind of says that both can symbolize both, depending on context. So... The point is that it was both of them. Don't get too attached to the particular one, and they both have aspects of both. The fact that a mountain is self-love and materialism can be seen from the symbolism of a mountain. All evil and falsity spring from self-love and materialism. Also, mountains are not all self-love. It's There's a positive and negative to everything, because you may like going to the mountains. Some mountains can also be a sign of uh, mutual love, so this is in its opposite sense. They have no other origin. Love for oneself and love of worldly advantages are the opposite of heavenly and spiritual love. Since they are the opposite, they are personified by people who work ceaselessly to destroy anything heavenly or spiritual in God's kingdom. Self-love and materialism give rise to all hatred, hatred to all vengefulness and cruelty, and vengefulness and all and cruelty to all deceit. In short, to all the hells. From the symbolism of mountains and towers as self-love and materialism, and this is sort of the, you know, in the negative sense, like the puffed up pride of people thinking I'm high above everyone else. We can deduce what it meant when the devil took the Lord onto a tall mountain and onto the pinnacle of the temple. It meant that he was being led into the very worst of his spiritual battles against love for himself and for the material world, or in other words, against the hells. Hardly anyone can see what the battles of spiritual crisis accomplish. They are means for dissolving and shaking off evil and falsity. They are also the means by which we develop a horror for evil and falsity, and gain not only conscience, but strength of conscience. And this is the way we are 
reborn. And that makes me think of, um, you know, if you really hit bottom with something, if there's something you're into and it, you you see, oh, this has now ruined something in my life. That's when you start to develop, as he says, a horror for it. Like, there's no way I would want to go do this. I see the damage this has caused. There's no way I'm picking that up. And that that's what these battles kind of do. Or you really see the the problem, some, the sickness something is, that really lets you cut ties with it. That's part of the function of these spiritual battles. Even though in these, these are probably pretty obscure anyway. Swedenborg says it's hard to know what these things do. It's We don't have a lot of good language around it. It's not a universally recognized phenomenon. People haven't studied it and put a good vocabulary to it. So it's sort of nebulous, but hopefully we're giving you enough specifics to kind of latch on to. And finally, I said we would talk about the angels ministering to him as being these truths. So let's take a look there. Apocalypse explains 650. Because temptations arise through evil spirits and genii, as as the old translation, who are from hell, demons is another way that's translated, thus through the hells, whence evils and falsities in their desires and lusts arise, therefore the beasts in this place with which the Lord was, meaning the beasts in the wilderness, and I think in Luke it says there were beasts in the wilderness, they do not mean beasts, but the hells, and the evil arising therefrom, and by the angels who ministered unto him are not meant angels, but divine truths, by means of which from his own power he conquered and subjugated the hells. So it's it's all symbolic. Even in the story when it says angels came, is actually the the truths, the the rock that he was able to deflect these, these falsities with. So, right, it's something about it all being together. You know, we've got, it's, it's not just a verbal to and fro, it's some kind of clash of truth and falsity, but it's also like the, the energy against energy we saw in those drawings, but it's also this sort of burning pain and, and learning to, I don't know, we're just putting spots on your map so you can get sort of a sense of it. We, we don't have the specifics of specifics, but hopefully I can start to draw a picture of there was work being done. And again, that is going on all through Jesus's life. It's not just, that's just a, an encapsulation of it. It's a table of contents of it. But this was from when he was young, right up to the end, that, that he was doing this work. And actually, we can learn some specifics about it, but not from the stories in the New Testament. We have to actually look back at the Old Testament for that. And we're going to do that right now. So, apparently, there is a catalog of all the specifics of what Jesus Christ went through in his life on this earth. And it's in a place that you've probably already looked, or a lot of people have, the Old Testament of the Bible. Swedenborg says this in Apocalypse Explained, 730, bracket 41. Some of his longer numbers have so many subsections <laughs> that there's 41, especially in this book, Apocalypse Explained. Man, that series of books has long numbers. Anyway, he's talking about this story in the wilderness. This does not mean that the Lord was tempted by the devil only 40 days and at the end of these, but that he was tempted throughout his whole life, even to the last moment when he suffered cruel anguish of heart in Gethsemane. And, you know, the Garden of Gethsemane story, that's what he's talking about. And afterwards, in the terrible passion of the cross, for by means of temptations admitted into the human which he had from the mother, the Lord subjugated all the hells. And at the same time glorified his human. All these temptations of the Lord are signified by the temptations in the wilderness during 40 days and 40 nights, because wilderness signifies a state of temptations, and 40 days and 40 nights their whole duration, as we've said before. No more is recorded of these by the evangelists, because thus much was revealed concerning them. Still, in the prophets, and especially in the Psalms of David, they are described at length. The beasts with which the Lord is said to have been signify infernal societies, and fasting here signifies affliction such as exists in the combats of temptation. So, back up one sentence, it was recorded in the prophets, which that's a word for part of the Old Testament, so it goes Moses and the prophets. So, if it's there, what's it like? And wouldn't Jesus have mentioned that if it was there? Actually, he did. Take a look at Luke 24. Uh, This is, I believe, the road to Emmaus. Then he said to them, this is talking to his disciples when they didn't know uh, that it was him, O foolish ones, and slow of heart to believe in all the prophets have spoken, ought not the Christ to have suffered these things and to enter into his glory? And beginning at Moses and all the prophets, that's the beginning of the Old Testament, he expounded to them in all the scriptures the things concerning 
himself. So in all the scriptures, there were things concerning himself. Swedenborg is saying, here's what those things mean. We'll begin with one of the, one of the, this may be a novel concept to a lot of people, but most people who have studied uh, the Bible agree that the following is a depiction of Jesus. So we'll let Jonathan Rose get another word in here as he describes sort of how a psalm of the Old Testament is describing the inner life of Jesus Christ. Uh, there's a passage in the Old Testament in Isaiah chapter 53, verse 7, and a lot of people have read this chapter as being all about Jesus. It's got remarkable things in it that sound like the crucifixion and this sort of thing. And one of the statements in there is this, he was oppressed and he was afflicted, yet he opened not his mouth. He was led as a lamb to the slaughter and as a sheep before its shearers is silent, so he opened not his mouth. And people have applied that to the crucifixion. There were moments in the crucifixion, uh, like in Luke 23, verses 8 and 9, uh, Herod sees Jesus, he's very glad, he's, he's long wanted to talk to him, he wants to see him do a miracle. And then he questioned him with many words, but he, Jesus, answered him, Herod, nothing. He answered him nothing. He didn't say anything. There are a few moments in the crucifixion where Jesus doesn't say anything, but actually, a lot of the time, he does say things. And in a lot of his life, he was talking all the time. So in what sense was he silent? The thing that Jesus was silent about was this torture that he was going through inwardly the whole time. He was being attacked by all the hells. It really makes sense when you think about it. it you know, you know when two football teams face each other, the defense knows who is the most powerful offensive weapon on the other side, and they're going to double team him, triple team him. Sometimes, you know, they're going to put everything. They're watching him. They rank the other players on the other side, and they say, "You, we don't really have to worry about. You don't do that much. This guy's a threat." You know. Well, can you imagine if God Himself is born in the flesh? Does hell want to shut him down? They want. They. They. They don't triple team him. They put everybody on the defense on that one player. They don't even play anybody else on the field. You know, every they've got everything. They bring everything against him. So he suffered in ways that we can't even imagine. So there you have, this is describing the, the psychological state of Jesus here in the words of the Old Testament. And this, that... That is all through Swedenborg. There are multiple layers of meaning, as Swedenborg describes it, with the Bible. And, you know, one of those is describing Jesus, because this is God coming as a person. And, and what Jesus went through is what we go through just on a larger scale, right? So it's everywhere. And I'll show you a different spin on it. There, Swedenborg's always talking about the internal sense of things. And here we have Lisa Hyatt Cooper, who's a translator of Swedenborg, talking about a, a segment of the inner sense that, that was especially meaningful to her and just happened to be about Jesus and what he went through. And this is a sort of more specific one we can talk about when we get back. Okay, so here's Lisa. I've been very touched to see how much Swedenborg says about emotion in the inner meaning of the word, the Old and New Testaments. He says that, for instance, there's a the story of Abraham going down to Egypt and telling Pharaoh that Sarai, his wife, was actually his sister, not his wife. And there's a place in that story where Pharaoh finds out and he says, why did you tell me that she was your sister? We could have been killed. And when Swedenborg's explaining the inner meaning of that phrase, he says, this is about the outrage that Jesus felt when he was young and had to transition from knowing truth under one form into knowing truth under another form. And that just blew my mind that here, it, Swedenberg is talking about Jesus as having outrage when he was a child. And he says that that emotion in Pharaoh's words is the inner meaning. And it could seem sort of strange that you're upset if you're Jesus. I knew things in this one way. Now I have to know them in another way. Is that something we really go through? So there are some, it is a little obscure, but there, there are certain parallels to it. You, you had something that you treasured and it's gone. And that, that some of these are going to seem a little bit like that, but 
if you haven't like if you haven't had depression, you don't know what it's like. If if you have had some of these inner sort of struggles where you lose some things or feel like you're losing things or something that you felt attached to, you can start to at least gain a sense of why that could be a big deal. But isn't that and that's not even necessarily a huge struggle or temptation he was going through that's just one little snippet of his life development but isn't that interesting he's this is a a very specific uh watershed little watershed that he went through and that kind of specificity is what swedenborg gives you with the old testament and we're going to do a little experiment here involving abram or abraham as he's known uh that story was involving him swedenborg says that all these stories of the old testament involving Abraham, on one level are involving the inner life of Jesus Christ, as well as these other levels we've talked about in other shows. So what we're going to do here is going to try to make it so everybody stops watching the show, because we're going to just describe these things in weird uh, detail that's hard to understand, and we're not going to give much explanation. We're just going to go one to the other, hopefully pique your curiosity. If so, pick up Secrets of Heaven, and you, uh, you can get that for free, and you can look through and get it. In the meantime, here's a quick tour of some, how these old stories depict what was going on with Jesus Christ. First one, this is the story of Abram and his herdsmen having conflict with his nephew Lot and his herdsmen for territory. And what this is symbolizing is that Jesus feels conflicted and disagree, conflict and disagreement between his inner, inner self perspective, <coughs> heavenly values and knowledge, and his outer self perspective values and knowledge gained from his senses. So that's like, uh, you know, with us, when the inner part and the outer part, your higher self and what you're doing out there are in conflict. All right, next story. There is a battle between uh, an alliance of four kings and an alliance of five kings. You may have heard of the story. It's sometimes called the Battle of Nine Kings. And at the end of the battle, Lot gets kidnapped, and then Abraham arranges his rescue. So what this is about, says Swedenborg, the child Jesus suffers a major attack from hellish self-love and materialism. There are those things come back, which are the five kings. He resists as best he can from his external, imperfect understanding of goodness and truth. That's the four kings. It's smaller because he was small and not as developed at the time. The battle against evil is won, but his outer self Lot is a symbol of the outer self. It's not a person. It's Jesus' outer self gets captured for a time in an outer perspective until his inner self, Abram, rescues him and pulls him back in to an inner perspective. So he's not, he gets a little out of his funk for a little while, but then he gets pulled back in. All right, that's that one. Next, maybe some of you know this story. Abram despairs about the fact that he has no child, no heir, and worries that he will never have one. But Jehovah promises that he will have as many descendants as the stars of heaven. And what this is in the psyche of Jesus is Jesus despairing about the fact that it seems like he will be unable to save anyone. The stars out there are us, you know, or, or you know what he's looking up. But his deepest inner self draws him into a vision of the future, showing that he indeed will be successful in saving the human race. If you had a mission that important and you thought this isn't going to work, all these people I care about, it's not going to work. But you know, the comfort in seeing the stars, no, it's going to be like this. All right. Then finally. Uh, there's the maybe the most famous story. It's called the Binding of Isaac. Abram is instructed to sacrifice his only son, Isaac. But at the last minute, an angel from Jehovah stops him, and they find a ram caught in a thicket to sacrifice instead. So what could that possibly mean? This is what it says. Jesus, from him, his inner self, Abram, which again, Abram consistently is symbolizing the inner self, knows that the rational level of his mind, Isaac, must be purified. Sacrifice a symbol for purified in order to be able to save and purify others. So he goes through intense trials that cause all the finite human elements in his rational mind to die, thus leaving it purified and divine. Then Jesus is able to free other spiritually minded people caught up in the natural world confusion, which is the, symbolized by the ram cotton so we're the ram in this story that because jesus freed up his mind he could free us and it sounds in the literal sense like oh he's killing killing the ram that's bad but that's that's an outer symbol it's not actually saying it's good to kill a ram this is just a container for the inner sense which is that that is freeing people's minds who are caught up in the thicket and lead them to that transformation all right so there they were there's those four things we're just zooming right through them uh there's more where that came from but it just gives you a sense of the kinds of things what does jesus think about what is he worried about that kind of stuff man all right 
we got to get to it, man. Everybody wants to talk about it. We couldn't finish a show without talking about the most, maybe the most famous Jesus story of all. Let's get to it now. So before we get in to the beginning of the Easter story, the crucifixion, let's step back for a second and just look more at why was Jesus going through all these struggles in the first place? I mean, it wasn't, why wouldn't he just come down and, and map things out so that he would have as good a time as possible? That's what we're trying to do, isn't it? Right? We're trying to make it so we live where we want to live and life goes like we want to have it go. Wouldn't he have the cash to do that? But there's a good reason why he took this road, and we're going to let Jonathan Rose explain more. And there's uh, finally a passage in Hebrews 12 that sort of explains what's going on here. This is about the removal of those things that are being shaken as of things that are made, that the things which cannot be shaken may remain. I like that image, that what this testing is, what it does is it attacks us and tests us because there's some stuff in us that's, that's weak and flawed and they can pick that off. You know, it's a lot like the Amalekites when the children of Israel were wandering in the wilderness. They had Amalekites who would attack them and they couldn't get rid of the whole children of Israel, but they'd attack the weak or the straggling, the sick and so on. It's a terrible image, but it's when it's talking about stuff that's within our consciousness, it's talking about getting rid of that part of us that's the weakest or the sickest, you know, stuff we don't need. It's, it's not, it's the part that can be shaken, which only has the opposite effect of what hell intends, which is that it strengthens the part in us that cannot be shaken. How did Jesus get to be Jesus? When you see him at birth, he's just this little child. He's not speaking, he's not doing miracles. When you see him when he's 12 years old, he has this great wisdom that he didn't have when he was a little child. And you see him interacting with the teachers, but he's not doing miracles and he, he's not, uh, preaching and teaching yet. And what happened between, between the time when he was 12 and when he was 30 that made him so powerful? His secret weapon was that he was tested. He went through this torment from hell that made him stronger and stronger. You see that little window of it in Matthew chapter 4 when he's interacting with that evil spirit. But he, he, was, he was tested and strengthened by that challenge from hell, that he just only got stronger and clearer. Psalm 23 says, you prepare a table before me in the presence of my enemies. Why do you want to dine in the presence of your enemies? Well, there's a strengthening that goes on. The Lord was actually being fed by that presence and getting clearer and stronger and more able to deal with hell as he went along. So he was going through this process. So because he was going through much more vicious temptations than we ever go through, he was much stronger. He came out because he had that divine love carrying him on in a, in a way that the rest of us would just, we'd cave, you know. We'd, we'd, we'd give up, we'd collapse. But he was able to take it because he was driven by that divine love, that desire to save the whole human race. And so he got really strong. His heart got so strong in what he was doing. So these spiritual struggles are something that we don't see much of, we don't know much about, uh, but it strengthens us. So that is something that happens for all of us, right? It's strength. We, even if we're not always aware, we can't say, oh yeah, when I was from, you know, 1983 to 1989, I was going through a big struggle, and then I took two years off. And then, it does happen, though. This is the same progression. That this, in the same way that Jesus was being strengthened through these, that's the, the things that come into our life that seem to be, why is this happening? No, not this. Now, that's that's pumping us up, man. That's doing the work, right? So Swedenborg talks about it more. I think this is our last trip to Secrets of Heaven, 1690. From his early youth up to the last hour of his life in the world, the Lord's life was one continuous struggle and one continuous victory, as many passages in the Old Testament word indicate. The Lord's trials did not end with the test he faced in the wilderness, as these words in Luke show. After the devil finished with all this testing, he left Jesus alone for a while. 
The same thing can be seen from the consideration that the Lord was tested up till his death on the cross and so to the last hour of his life in the world. This evidence makes it clear that the Lord's whole life in the world, from early youth on, consisted of constant trials and constant victories, the last of which occurred on the cross, where he prayed for his enemies and so for everyone everywhere in the world. So it's not like there's been sort of... um this idea put forward that the whole point of Jesus coming was the cross. You've got God is angry, you need, somebody needs to get on that cross, and then, then that was the whole point. Everything else was just sort of leading up to that. Swedenborg describes that the cross is the cap on the end of, this is the, the finale, but the whole life was, was the same process. The, the work Jesus was doing all throughout his life was all important, and it all needed to happen. Because otherwise, why didn't he just appear at 33 years old and, and just have the one week be his whole life? You know, he does this in order because he's laying the groundwork through all these different struggles. He's doing work the whole time. It's not like he had a big vacation to start it. So the cross is meaningful, but it's not the meaning. It's, it's part of it's a part of the whole thing. So, what was it though? What was the meaning of the cross? So, you remember back before I said we would keep you watching by not telling you how Jesus was struggling against the angels. So, you must still be watching. So, your reward is we're returning to that now. Uh, we're going to talk about what Jesus went on, went through on the cross and how that had to do with even the heavens. And again, Far. Let's let's bear, bid farewell to to our friend Jonathan Rose. This is really fun because he 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 really has studied a lot of this stuff. So it was cool just getting to sit down and hear him talk about it all. And this is our last clip from that, and it's explaining the meaning of the of the time on the cross. Yes, what is the crucifixion all about? What a great mystery! It's so clearly portrayed in the Gospels, and yet we don't really know what was he doing. There's different theories about what he was doing, what was going on there. Um, a very interesting teaching to me and one that I wrestled with a lot that Swedenborg says fascinating to me uh, how to set this up uh, you would think like a lot of movies are structured in the way that you know let's say you're James Bond or something like that you fight this sort of assistant and then you fight the general manager guy, <laughs> and then finally you get back to the kingpin and you fight him at the end of the movie. Swedenborg says it went absolutely the opposite way around with Jesus, that he actually fought the worst devils from the lowest hell at the beginning when he was very, very young, and they weren't hard for him to deal with. It's not difficult to deal with the really obviously evil. This is hidden in the, in the inner meaning of the story when Moses is able to discern between a Hebrew and an Egyptian who are fighting. But the next day he sees two Hebrews fighting and it's harder to tell who, whose side am I on, you know, who do I side with in this exchange. That's a, an interesting little picture of the, the way that Jesus' battles went, that he actually, when he was young, he dealt with the worst, the worst evil spirits were at the beginning and he worked his way up. And he not only worked his way through all the evil spirits, but it, this is a very strange teaching. I don't think this is anywhere in the world that, that this has been revealed before. Uh, but at the very end of his life, who Jesus was dealing with were the people in the highest heavens were letting him down. Not that they were attacking him, but just that they were falling short. He had rolled down all the way through till at the point of the crucifixion, the people he was dealing with were people who didn't really believe he could do it or didn't think the crucifixion was a good idea or whatever. And this was causing him a very profound kind of inward agony because these were his homies, you know, these were his friends. Uh, you know, it says something in the, in the uh, Old Testament about the wounds that I suffered in the house of my friends. Uh, the, the, some of the most challenging things. And you see an image of this in the New Testament, don't you? Because the 12 disciples, or in, in a lot of the Gospels, all 12 abandon him. In the Gospel of John, John is still hanging out there by the cross. But, but they, most of them just like flee. It says, I'll smite the, the shepherd and scatter the sheep, you know. And that's a picture of the way that the angels, even the angels were like 
couldn't hang in there, couldn't couldn't take it anymore. Even the, his support group was, was, was letting him down. Not that he wasn't being attacked by the hell at that time, because they were full on. They were like rejoicing, like, hey, we won. You know, they felt like, hey, yeah, yeah, we, we, we've done it. We killed him, you know, like we succeeded. We succeeded. That parable about the killing the vineyard owner's son, you know, like the, here's the, he's the heir. Let's kill him and then we can take over the vineyard and everything. And they kill him, they think they're winning. And I think he actually let them, in a weird way, I think he let them feel like they won. Uh, but he was resurrected and, and larger than life and eternal and indestructible, you know, it, it, like he just went up to the next level. The specific struggle that Jesus was going through in the crucifixion uh, was, it seems clear to me, that to keep being loving, to keep coming from love, when you're being tortured, you know, you've been kept up all night, you're, you're being tortured, you're being passed from pillar to post, you're beaten, you're whipped, you're, you're you know, put the crown of thorns on and all that stuff and just keep coming from love. I don't think we understand. You know, we would all fail that test. What I would, I would, I would just be a flaming rage, you know, <laughs> or something like I would fail that test. You know, hell wants to sort of bait you into getting down on their level and getting angry or something like that. He keeps coming from love. He says, Father, forgive them for they don't know what they do. And he was able to succeed in that greatest of all tests. So that was the ultimate test. That was the ultimate test, the hardest test that he ever went through. And I think it wasn't just that he was being tested by the highest heavens, it was the whole package. The hells, the heavens, everybody kind of letting him down. And obviously some sense that he had failed, he felt abandoned by the Father and everything. It was a very, you see him sweating drops like blood in the Garden of Gethsemane in, in agony the night before. And uh, it, it was really, really challenging. And I think it had to do with both how people were letting him down, even the good people, and how difficult it was to maintain coming from love when you're being physically tormented and tortured to death. And that was, a, that was a, a unbelievable challenge that we can't even imagine what he went through. And not only that, but the work that he did opens up a path for us. That there, there's because it, it's all connected, heaven and hell, the psyche. So the ordering that he did in there, through all these battles and these struggles, opens a path for us to to kind of work on our own cross. Uh, which is there's a, the concept out there that that we have this same struggle. And how do we do it, and how does it show up, and what can we learn about our own battle? from the spiritual battles of Jesus Christ. Let's take a look at Apocalypse Explained 893. In respect to temptations, there are spiritual temptations which those undergo who receive genuine charity from the Lord. For, so when we're becoming better people, for such must fight against the evils that are in every man from birth. That's the hereditary evil we were talking about. And some must fight against the falsities that they have imbibed from childhood from masters and preachers respecting faith alone. So bad, bad teachings, bad ideas. These falsities and evils are removed by the combats of temptations. This is what is meant by the cross. And to follow the Lord means to acknowledge his divine and to do his commandments. The cross means temptations because the evils and the falsities therefrom that cling to man from his birth infest and thus torment those who are natural when they're becoming spiritual. So old, old school language is quite dramatic. And as those evils and their falsities that infest and torment can be dispersed only by temptations. Temptations are signified by the cross. So, only by temptations. Through these same struggles, we get rid of the things that are actually driving, you know, dragging us down. It doesn't feel like it, but it's something good. And there's a joining that happens, too, when we read that in our last number, Secrets of Heaven, 1737. The Lord achieved and created the union of his human and divine qualities through the con constant conflicts and victories of his spiritual trials, and he did so by his own power. Anyone who thinks this union and oneness occurred in any other way is very much mistaken. As a result, the Lord became the embodiment of uprightness. What he eventually united or identified with was heavenly love, that is, love itself, which is Jehovah, as noted above. Our own close connection with the Lord also comes about through times of trial and through the grafting 
of faith onto love. Unless faith is implanted in love, or in other words, unless the tenets of faith lead us to live a life of faith, which is charity, the bond will never develop. This alone is following him or forming as close a bond with the Lord as the Lord's human part formed with Jehovah. A life of faith is also what causes all who live to be called God's children after the Lord who is the only child of God and to become images of him. All right, so a lot of stuff in there, a lot of terminology, but the takeaway is this joining process that Jesus had, taking the human side of things and joining it with God. We can do that inside us too, and it's through doing our own struggles, through overcoming when things get rough, putting love into practice. Can you? Can we still do love? Going through times that break us down a bit so we know, oh, I don't know everything. I, introducing humility. And also, it's when we really see that these truths, the spiritual things that we learn, fight for us. That these are the, you know, before it said the angels that were consoling Jesus in the wilderness, that that was, that those were symbols of the truths that console. And I've, I've found this, that this is actually true. This actually happens. And, and that is when you are really down, when, when you are really getting attacked in the mind, like by negative thoughts and feelings, by worries, by fears, all this kind of stuff, what I found is what, what really protects you are these sort of eternal spiritual principles, that if you're getting attacked about something about yourself or your life or something, you can try to fight back, like, well, you know, the maybe I messed this up, but I'll do good at this, or maybe I'm like this, but my life will turn out this way. That just is ammunition. But if you are coming from these higher principles, with this, that actually, that that it's going to be okay. I don't need to worry about how I'm doing in comparison with other people because we all are in this together. Those kinds of things, those are like angels. The, and you find, you start to find when you're in the thick of things, when you're getting attacked, when you're getting broken down, you start to see, oh, this is, this is what works. This is actually what helps. Everything else drags me deeper in, but these spiritual truths are what help. People ask, why are you so into Swedenborg? That's why. Because when things got rough and get rough for me, that's what helps. The principles that I find in this like obscure, like, you know, difficultly worded text and all this terminology, when you get the principles out of it, when you need it, when you're in, out in the wilderness, for me, that's what feeds me, you know. That's, that's what works. And I've seen the leverage that can provide, and I want to communicate that leverage to anybody who wants to listen. So thank you guys for listening. And if you even were close to enjoying lis- listening to this, please like the video. That will help YouTube think that we're cool. Subscribe to the channel, both because you'll get our videos and because that will help YouTube think we're cool. And if they think we're cool, they'll spread these videos to other people who just may think they're cool. Cool? All right, we're going to take a video break now, and we're going to get to your questions and comments. I'd love to hear what you have to say. All right, thanks. All right, as I was as I was reading through, it's just like, man, there's so much going on here. Uh, am I explaining this correctly? Does this make any sense? Uh, is this a waste of time? So I'd love to hear if it is or not. Uh, let's see, take a look at our, our questions today. Richie, how did Jesus deal with the animal parts of his nature? I think you see this, you know, you can sort of, see, like the animal parts of all of us, the the instinctive kind of uh, tribal type urges, you know, you see Swedenborg describing Jesus as getting, like the five and the four kings, getting attacks from these, this sort of self-love uh, materialism and him being able to push back through realizing his dependence on divine truth and divine love, right? That, and using those. And that you see this sort of mirrored in the, the, the debate in the wilderness that the devil is coming at him with all these, hey, why don't you do this? Don't you need this? And he's quoting this divine truth back at it. So that's if you're using animal in the sense of like animal as lower. Sometimes there, There's a lot of other means meanings for the word animal, and I haven't answered it for those. So if I misread you, I'm sorry. Hopefully somebody in the chat room can give you a better answer than that. All right, next, 
This is, Rick, is Jesus the avatar of God or is Jesus his own being? But whose union with God is so perfect and absolute, it is like as if he was God. Uh, As Swedenborg would say it, Jesus is the avatar of God. Meaning, there's the infinite divine, there's the, the infinite divine, right? Whatever that is, no time and space, total love, total wisdom, the source of all being and creation and existence. And if you could take that and put it in a form where it could sit in that chair and talk to you, that's Jesus Christ. That's the uniting of the, the divine and the human. So it's Swedenborg, other people don't, but Swedenborg doesn't say, even though there's an appearance of Jesus being more or less connected to divine love, it's, there was a somehow it's done so that the, the human manifestation could feel like separate at times. Um, just like some people say, we're all separate. We all feel separate even though we're not. Um, Jesus is God. That's what uh, that's what Swedenborg says, that it's not that there are a couple of divine beings. There's just one, and Jesus has taken that in infinite, indivisible divine and putting it in a form that you can, like, give a high five to. That's what he says. All right, next we have uh, Ginger. What would Jesus say about pointing out people around you that have evilness in them? Do we point out their evils or do we let them walk their own spiritual path and love them from afar? Oh, man, that's a great question. I don't know, man. Context, <laughs> maybe, maybe not. Because you see it in the the stories of Jesus that he says, hey, man, why are you going to point out someone else's evil or a plank in their, a moat in their eye when you have a beam in your own eye? Right? So judge not, lest ye be judged. However, he certainly does go on and on at this, particularly the scribes and Pharisees, the people who are abusing religion. Uh, he goes on and on at them. He points it out, points it out, points it out. Then again, there's the, uh, the woman who's washing his feet, you know, and, and the people that are with him, which I think are scribes and Pharisees, right, uh, are like, hey, man, do you know what she does? She's a prostitute or something. And and he's like, hey, she's being nice. Leave her alone. Um, the woman caught in adultery. Go and sin no more. Uh, but there are other times when he goes into the, flips all the tables over in the temple. So it seems like he does both, right? And isn't that the tough thing? And I, so I can't give specific advice. What I would say is, where are we coming from? You know, where are we coming from? Love and wisdom. Love means there's an, it's easy, you know, Swedenborg says that evil spirits love to point out evil in other people. And you see this, that, there's, that they're pointing out evil, that actually the most people that are the hardest to be around want to point out evil and other, we want to gossip about other people, say this is, this is what they do that's evil. Yeah. Um, that's not it. But there is do you love the person as in, are you not thinking about the joy you'll get from talking about their evil or their self-righteousness? Are you thinking about their future? Are you picturing them, you know, living a happy life going forward and how you can get them there? That's the love part. The wisdom is a discernment. Is it going to do any good? What's the impact of me saying this thing right now? Do they need to hear that? Uh, And of course, we have we have our own judgment to make. In general, probably we want to point out what we would consider evil to other people more often than we should. <laughs> so maybe if there's doubt, don't do it, but you think on it long and hard and make sure, you maybe take time to yourself to see, search your own heart. Am I coming from love? Is this really love or is this self centeredness That would be my best guess. I don't know though. It's a tough one. Thank you. Okay. More, more. Let's take more. I know the show went a little long, but we're going to get questions in here anyway. Braydon, what was the star that led the wise men to Jesus? Was it a star or was it the sun? Well, physically, I think from a Swedenborgian perspective, there's not commentary that it was a star. Um, that it, it wasn't the sun. I haven't, or I haven't heard that in Swedenborg. As far as the symbolism. Of it, that because Swedenborg says everything symbolizes something. Man, I don't know, um, but but because it's, I don't want to just act like I know what he says that corresponds to. That's a very specific thing. I know that we did do a video that was called "The Christmas in You," where we talk about that story. There's actually not a ton about that story, as popular as that story is. There's not a ton about it in Swedenborg. We did a video called "The Christmas in You." It's on this channel, and if you look at that. 
it does have a label for the star, and I believe that label was higher truths, that uh, this, these are the things that we know in our minds, that, and that is like, like the, what, what we aspire to, you know, and that is what takes you in the direction of the love, which is the baby Jesus. That's what I believe. Um, but but you, can, you can check out that video and, and research it more. Okay, there's my sort of answer for that. Let's take another one. I'm on a, an anti-roll. Barb, was Jesus being tested by the same hell as Swedenborg speaks of seeing in the afterlife? How does that happen? Yeah, so there, Swedenborg will say there are multiple hells, but there's, there's just one hell. There are, there are subsections of hell, but he'll call those hells. Yes, the answer is yes, although, you know, Swedenborg was seeing that hell a um, number of years in the future, you know, starting at like 1750s or something like that. Um, things had changed since the time of Jesus, um, even though there's not time and space. I don't know. But the point is, how can you be tempted by hell like that there are, in hell, everybody everybody who's chosen hell does so because they love evil in some way. And e- loving evil naturally may, means you want to harm people because you love power, you love money, and you hate people that stand in the, your way of that. So everybody in hell is burning, in the deepest part of them, burning to harm other people, that, to have power over other people. So most of the time they're kept in check by the structure of hell, Right? That's, that's why hell is there, to make it so they can actually have a decent life and, and not get and, and have some interaction with people. But if you loosen the bonds, they go, they go crazy. Sometimes those bonds are loosened if it does good. For in this case, to let them have access to Jesus so we could push them back. Right? Does that make sense? Hopefully so. There's my best answer. We have we got four more questions. Let's get to them. Rink. <laughs> Did Jesus struggle with wanting to fall in love with a woman and start a family? Um, that is a that in isn't that the Da Vinci Code is all about that movie is all about what did Jesus have a wife and and we didn't know that um, that was not the um, that was not a struggle Swedenborg described and I think it is because by the time he was that age that was like a, that's a very like a personal thing but he was thinking about everybody you know that that he wouldn't want to uh, oh i there here's one woman that i love uh i want to be with her to him the the wife of god is what swedenborg is the part in all of us that wants to be good you know that's the part that can be joined with god when we're talking at the end uh about you, you can become more and more closely united to the divine. That's our marriage with God. So all of us are the wife of God. Do you know what I'm saying? So it, there wasn't, he wouldn't have that tendency. Now, whether there was a struggle with that, his natural self saying, oh, I just want to just want to start that. Um, Swedenborg doesn't describe it. Uh, maybe it happened. You know, he was a person and maybe he had those same kind of things. Um, but it doesn't describe it. Cool. All right. Great. Thanks for the question. Three more. Claire, what is the best way to approach our own big battles? Wow. That's a great question. Load up. you got to have weapons. Um, load, load up on truth. I mean, what do you really believe is, is the thing that's, that's true and loving? You know, if you have these concepts in the mind, you got to have it to fall back on. If you're going to get shaken spiritually, uh, all the stuff in your life can come under attack. What what do you really believe on? How do you call on your higher power? You know, how do you do that? Have those channels ready. Have support network of people, right? Because what I find, hell attacks you through what you love and what you think. Other people can be outside that, and they can help lift you up, help you remember things. And I'd say, you know, you can have a cheat sheet. You can have like a piece of paper or, or some kind of document or something that, ha- oh, this, this quote always lifts me up. Or this, remembering this thing, that, you know, calling this person. Have them there because when you're in the thick of it, you don't always remember that stuff. Um, have them there to check out. You know, we made a, a video about that called How to Stop Unwanted Thoughts. But I'd say have something there ready. So either way, it's going to be... It's going to be tough, but yeah, there, there are steps I think you can take to, to make it less hard to go through. So that's cool. Good question. Two more. Wendy. So what do you think Jesus is doing now? Yeah, man. Uh, I think that 
he is hanging out with you, meaning that that Jesus is the divine human, but you uni- but through the life on earth is united to God, so that the the consciousness of God, who knows everyone, does everything. That that is the the human God is that. I don't know if it's if it's a now thing or what, but that that Jesus is with everybody. You know, Jesus is in your heart. Don't they say that? Um, that that Jesus is currently trying to still trying to save the whole human race because because there's problems. People are not that great to each other all the time. We don't always follow the healthiest things. Jesus is constantly, Jesus, you know, being the manifestation of God, is constantly trying to get people to reject evil and choose good, and working individually in each person's life to do that. There was a major restructuring. Now, I th- and also it might be like Swedenborg talks a lot about this new church, this new state of mind that, that is going to bring the human race into a new era of, of love, and that Jesus is probably trying to make that happen, you know? So there's, I don't know if there's like, if he has like a calendar or phases or what, although Swedenborg says to, to the divine, all time is the present, but Jesus is trying right now to bring us into this new phase of love, get us all to work together and, and be good. That's what I think anyway. All right, let's take one more. Thank you guys for these great questions. Barb, I wonder how God could become God before having had a human experience. Yeah, good question. And I, I haven't really thought of that before, but if this was part of making him who he was, you know, how'd you get there in the first place? What was added? Can a God really be changed by it? It's all too much to think about. So hopefully we've given you some tools in this episode, to start to think about that kind of stuff. Appreciate you hanging with us. Appreciate the questions. You know, it's been a longer one, but I think an interesting one, and hopefully you enjoyed it. Uh, It's great hanging out with you guys. Uh, Thanks, and if you want to help this kind of thing continue, consider making a donation. We have a, there's a lot of ways you can do it. There's a button on the front page. You can click this link. You can click click this box. You can click a link in the description. You can hover over this thing and click that little eye that appears. Your donations go to the Swedenborg Foundation, which is us, which is running this thing. It's a nonprofit. It's tax deductible, and we use it to just get the message out. You look at this, just free programming that we like to put out there. So, and it also, because we got a grant, it will be matched five to one. So your donation will go a long way towards making it happen. Thanks for thinking of it, and we want you back next week. We're going to be hanging out, talking about where dreams come from. So if you've ever had a dream and wondered, how did that get there? We'll find out next week. See you then.